some very practical ways in their own lives. So appreciate your prayers on my behalf in that regard. And Lord willing, I'll be here Sunday next week as well. All right, to 1 Corinthians 15. The key verse of 1 Corinthians 15 is verse 12. And the reason why that's the key verse is because it asks the question, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul was writing to a congregation in Corinth that had lots of problems and lots of doctrinal difficulties. And he saved this one, which may have been the biggest and most serious for last. At 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through verse 58 is a lengthy defense of the reality that we are going to rise from the dead one day. Those who die, the dead will rise one day and the living will be changed when the Lord returns. There were some people in the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, 12, that were saying, no, that's not true. Nobody is rising from the dead. Once somebody dies, that's it. That's all there is for them. And Paul says that's absolutely not true. In fact, this is a linchpin of New Testament Christian doctrine. This is a really important truth. As we review just briefly what we've talked about in the two previous lessons, because I know you've slept since then, this was back in March. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 19, Paul gives a number of arguments how you can know for a fact that Jesus is risen from the dead. And so if anybody wants to argue that the dead don't rise, what are you going to do with Jesus? Because he clearly rose from the dead. There's an apologetic argument. There's the argument from witnesses. Paul says the dead have risen because Jesus rose from the dead. And then based on that truth in verses 20 through 34, the conclusion is therefore our resurrection is guaranteed. Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What that means is Jesus is the first person that came back from the dead and he's never gonna die again. Everybody else that ever rose from the dead in the Bible, everybody else died again. Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, others that rose from the dead, God raised them up, but they died again. They had another funeral for them. Not so with Jesus. He rose from the dead and he's never going to die again. And that guarantees that one day all those who have died are going to rise from the dead and they're not going to die again either. That includes us. So because Jesus rose from the dead, our future resurrection is guaranteed. It's going to happen. There is no stopping it. There's nothing that can change this. And then the third part of this study, which is what our concern is tonight, is verses 35 through 58. And it begins in verse 35 where the question is asked, how then are the dead raised? And you can kind of stop and imagine why somebody, if, if they're skeptical about this, okay? The idea that someone who dies is going to rise from the dead. If I can just be honest and blunt, when somebody passes away, their body begins to decay. And as we bury that body, that body continues to decay. And if somebody's skeptical about this doctrine that the dead rise, they're going to ask, you know, well, okay, if Jesus rose from the dead, all right, he was only dead for, you know, three days and three nights. But if somebody who's been dead for a year or a hundred years or a thousand years, if somebody like that comes back, how are they going to be raised from the dead? What are they going to look like? You kind of see where this question comes from, Right. And that's the point of this section of the New Testament. Paul is going to tell you some things, and I want to say at the front, he doesn't tell us everything we would like to know about this. In fact, he himself doesn't have all the answers. All he can do is give us illustrations and comparisons. That's what our outline is tonight. And he can tell us a little bit about what the future body we're going to have is like, but he doesn't give us everything that we'd like to know. He just, he can't because it's not all been revealed to us yet. It will be one day when the resurrection happens, but we don't know yet. When Benjamin Franklin was a young man, he was a book printer. And I don't think that Benjamin Franklin's theology or his ideas about God were necessarily all that all that wonderful, but he did have this right. When he was a book printer as a young man, about 23, 24 years old, he wrote himself an epitaph. And here's what he said, Benjamin Franklin. This was his epitaph as a young man, because he was thinking about this doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. He said, here lies the body of Benjamin Franklin printer. Like the cover of an old book, its contents are torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding. It lies here, food for worms, talking about his body. 
but the work shall not be lost for it will as he, Benjamin Franklin believed, appear once more in a new and more elegant edition revised and corrected by the author. What he's saying is, here lies the body of Benjamin Franklin, but it's going to come back from the dead one day and it's going to be better than it was. That's the teaching of 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 through 58, that one day all those who have died are going to return and they're going to be better. The body that we have is going to be better than the one we have right now. Let's dive into this for just a few minutes. When you look at 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 35, you're going to notice in the first place that there are in this chapter um, a number of things that are, that are being asked. The first is, how are the dead raised? If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? And again, with what kind of body do they come? So that's the subject of this section of Scripture. How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Before we begin our outline, I would like to tell you something about yourself. This is biblical. You are, right now, a body with a spirit living inside. The Bible tells us that. Forgive my crude artwork and forgive the crude representation here, but it's something that I think makes a point. Glenn thinks this is great. He said, all right, this is, something that, this is something that you need to understand about yourself. Scripture tells us that we are a spirit living in a body. And it says, for example, when Jesus died on the cross, he yielded up his spirit. Remember? Or it says in James 2 verse 26, the body without the spirit is dead. I've been in the room a couple of times in my life with somebody who actually left this world. And by faith, I didn't see their spirit leave their body, but by faith, I believe that's what happened. I've never seen a human spirit, neither have you. You can't. By definition, you don't see a spirit. But by faith, I believe that's what happened because God's word tells me that's what we are. We are spirits that live in bodies. And so when someone takes their last breath, when their heart beats that last time and they expire, what is happening is their spirit is departing from their body. You can read Acts chapter nine where Dorcas, Tabitha, she was dead. Her body was there and they were mourning and weeping over her. And the, the Bible describes that they were showing the tunics that she had made while she was with them. That's interesting, it says it that way, that while she was with them that she had made these tunics. But there's her body right there, but no, she's not there anymore. Her spirit has departed her body. Everybody with me so far? This means yes, okay? So you are a spirit living in a body. And what happens when you die is that your spirit leaves your body. And so we take bodies typically and we bury them. And the question that's being asked is, okay, Paul, if you're going to argue in 1 Corinthians 15 that there is a resurrection from the dead, we want to know about that body. We want to know what that's like. That's what he's doing. And he can't really tell you everything you'd like to know. But here's some things that he does say. In the first place, he gives you some illustrations. Read with me, if you would, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 35 or verse 36. Okay, what kind of body do they come with? Paul starts with this, you foolish person. That's kind of surprising. But here's why he's saying this, because there are skeptics in Corinth. There are people that still, after all that he's written, that still are not going to believe and buy into this idea that there is a resurrection of the dead. And so this is their skeptical question. Well, what kind of body are they going to have? Because I've seen some, I've seen some long deceased people and it's not a pretty sight. You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. He's using illustrations here now to describe what's going to happen. All right, I'm going to use my crude design. And uh, let's, just, let's just put this this way on the screen behind me. There is you and me before we pass from this life. So the, 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 the white outline represents this body that I'm in right now. There is a future, and I made it gold for you. That's your future resurrection body, okay? 
And the question is, what's that body like? The first body is buried in the ground and the second one is what comes out of the ground, according to this passage. And Paul argues in verses 36 through 38, the body that rises is different from this one. It's the same, but different in the same way that a seed is the same, but different from the fruit it produces. There's continuity, you see. There's continuity because you take a grain of wheat and you put it in the ground. The grain dies through some process that we don't see with our eyes, but we know it happens. The grain dies and it begins to produce something new. And what is produced has continuity with what was buried. And yet it's different. And so the best I can tell you tonight as we talk about this There's coming a day when I am going to have a different body than this one, but it's going to be the same. Same but different. That's what this passage is telling us. It's going to be the same but different. A spirit living in a body, not quite like this body in some ways. It's like the difference between seed and fruit. Or look at verse 39 of this passage. He says, For not all flesh is the same. There's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. They're all kind of the same, but they're different. The difference between the flesh of a fish and the flesh of a dog, for example. They're similar, but different. And then when Paul talks about the differences, he talks about the difference between heavenly and earthly bodies. Look at verses 40 and 41. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for star differs from star in glory. When you walk outside and you look up during the day, the sun has glory, but the moon has glory too. And it's a different kind of glory. It's the same, but different. And what the Bible is doing for us, brothers and sisters and friends, is trying in the very best way that it's the very best language that could be used. This is inspired language to try to describe to us and illustrate for us the body we're going to have is going to be the same but different. Like the difference between the sunlight and the moonlight, like the difference between human flesh and an animal's flesh, like the difference between a seed and a grain or seed and the the fruit that it produces. It'll be the same but different. Everybody with me so far? Okay, I still have questions about this. Please understand. I know I can see on your faces some confusion. I understand. I have confusion about this too. I wish that molecular biology had just been spelled out and we could just know that this and this and this and this are all gonna happen, but the Bible doesn't give us that. God wants us though to know this. The dead are going to rise one day and they're going to have bodies that are the same but different. Like the difference between an animal's flesh and a human's flesh. The same but different. Secondly, as you look at verses 42 and following, after giving these illustrations, what Paul does is turn to comparisons. Verses 42 through 49. Listen to what he writes, beginning in verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. He says... There's my illustration on the screen again. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. See that in verse 42? This body is perishable. That means it grows old, it decays, it breaks down, it wears out. Sooner or later, you have to get injections of cortisone and you have to have knee replacement. It's perishable. It wears out, hair falls out, all kinds of bad things happen as you age. It's a perishable body, even if you don't live to an old age. Your body is subject to decay and destruction. You could easily be harmed in very serious ways if you get in the wrong side of machinery. It's a perishable body, but the one that comes out of the grave is imperishable. That's God's word, that's what he says. Not subject to decay. I love the old song, we'll never grow old in the land where we never grow old. You remember that song? We don't sing it very much anymore, but it talks about a land where everybody is imperishable in their resurrection bodies. Second, as you continue these comparisons, look at verse 43. He says in verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. 
it is raised in glory. When you think about bodies that have, that have died, there's not much honorable about them. We, we try really hard to make them look good and you know, we, we try to dress them up and place them in caskets so that we can remember our loved one, but it's a dishonorable thing. It's sown in dishonor, but when it is raised, God says, it's raised in glory. Continuing in verse 43 again, he says, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. You see the comparisons? Continuing in verse 44, he goes on to say, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. I don't understand all of what that means. However, there are a lot of people that key in on that word spiritual and they equate that word spiritual, I'm gonna use my pointer here, they equate that word spiritual to the actual spirit that lives in the body. They're two different things. There is a spirit and there is a resurrection body, a spirit that lives in a resurrection body. Now God calls that resurrection body a spiritual body. Well, what do you think that means, John? I have no idea. I know that it's like the difference between a human's flesh and an animal's flesh or the glory of the sun and the glory of the moon. I know that it's the same but different. But what does it mean that the the body is a spiritual body? That's the word God used and he just wants us to understand there's something that's unique about this that relates to spiritual things. It is a body, if you want to write this down in your notes, it is a body that is perfectly suited for heaven. Whatever that means, a body that is perfectly suited for the heavenly realm, a spiritual body. Continuing, if you look at verse 45, Paul goes on and he writes in verse 45, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. And you know, we're all descendants of Adam because he was the first man. But the last Adam, talking about Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. And so, All he's saying here, this is not about salvation, this is not about um, people becoming Christians, this is not about any of that. He's saying that you and I, we partake in the body that is like Adam's body. God made Adam, a spirit living in a body, and we have a body that's like Adam's body right now. But when Jesus returns and the dead rise and the living are changed, we're going to have a body like the one that Jesus, the last Adam, can give us. That's all that's saying. And everybody gets one, whether you're wicked, whether you're good, everybody rises from the dead. The Bible teaches that. Jesus says in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, the hour is coming when all who are in the graves will hear my voice and they will rise. Those who have done good to a resurrection of life, those who have done evil to a resurrection of condemnation. Jesus said everybody's going to rise from the dead. We're all going to have a body like the last Adam, according to this passage. Continuing, look at verse 47. Paul writes, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. That's how God made Adam, out of the dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, verse 48, so are those who are of dust. As is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. All he's saying, people that are of the dust, you and me right now, We're going to grow old and eventually it's appointed a man wants to die. This is what happens to those who are of the dust. But when we have our body, which is of heaven, it's going to be like the body that Jesus possesses. It's going to be like his from heaven. Again, look at verse 54. We're just going to jump down for a moment because he's making comparisons down there as well. In verse 54, he says, this is mortal, perishable, if you will. It's mortal body that puts on immortality. It's a perishable body that puts on imperishable. The body that we're going to have, according to this passage, is a body that, now as you look at that list, it's an imperishable body, a glorious body, a body that's raised in power, a body that is spiritual, whatever that means. It's a body that is like that of the last Adam, not of the first Adam. It's a body that is from heaven, and it's a body that is immortal. Can I just make a couple of applications for a moment? I go to hospitals all the time 
because people's bodies get sick, they get, they get diseased, they, they all, kind, all kinds of things go wrong, there are going to be no hospitals in heaven. I attend funerals, and I preach funerals a lot because we have bodies that are of the dust, and these bodies are going to decay and grow old, and they're going to die, and we're all going to, if the Lord doesn't return first, we're all going to have some kind of funeral memorial service. There's going to be no funerals in heaven. And I got this watch, you know, that's keeping up with, you know, it tells me all about my body and what's going on and, you know, things that I didn't even know I needed to know. And uh, it talks about all kinds of health things. You don't need any of that in heaven. And the reason why you don't is because the body that you have in heaven is immortal. It's imperishable. It's glorious. It's raised in power. It is a tremendous blessing from God. This is what God is going to do for every single one of us. And brethren, don't miss the point. I got lots of questions still about all this, but I'll tell you, this is supposed to give us hope. This is supposed to help us to see God has wonderful things in store for us. And Paul is really incensed that there would be anybody in Corinth that would try to say, no, it's not, it's not true that you rise from the dead. That's never going to happen. Yes, it will. And the reason why I know it will is because Jesus rose from the dead and his resurrection guarantees ours. And what kind of body are we going to have? That's the best Paul can do using inspired language that is from God. But that ought to be enough for us. That's our hope. Those are the comparisons he makes. And then, as you look at this passage, there is a transformation that's described in verse 50. Because Paul's skeptics, as he knows, are still going to ask questions about all this. And one of the questions they're going to ask is, all right, Paul, so the dead are going to rise. What about the living? What about people that haven't died? I mean, you're saying that Jesus is going to return. He's going to come even as he left. We read about that this morning in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. And so if that's true, if Jesus is going to return, obviously not everybody's going to be dead. So what happens to the living? Aha, look at verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now stop right there. When he says flesh and blood, you've got to stay with the context and you've got to listen very carefully to the argument that he's making. He's been talking about, I'm backing up here, a perishable, dishonorable, weak, natural, from dust, mortal kind of body. And when he says flesh and blood, that's all he means. How do you know that, John? I know that because I've been reading 1 Corinthians 15. Flesh and blood may mean other things in other places in the Bible, but the context here controls what that phrase means. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. What does he mean? He means that you can't go to heaven with this kind of body over here on the left. You can't. Why not? Because that kind of body can't inherit the kingdom. That's just the way God ordained it. Okay, so if that's true, then he says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So, behold, I tell you a mystery. Verse 51, we shall not all sleep. In other words, he's using that as a euphemism for death. Not everybody's going to die before Jesus returns. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. When Jesus returns, brothers and sisters and friends, a couple things are going to happen. The Bible tells us that the dead are going to rise out of their graves. They are going to have their new, imperishable, powerful, glorious bodies. They're going to rise out of their graves. Their spirits, by the way, when somebody leaves this world, their spirit goes to a place of either paradise or torment, according to Scripture. If you've been righteous, things are really good. If you've been wicked, things are not good. But those spirits are disembodied spirits. And those spirits are not going to remain disembodied, according to this passage right here. Rather, they are going to return to their bodies. They're going to come with a body that is similar but different. And those who are living, it says, will be changed, verse 51. 
how are we going to be changed? It's going to be like a slow process. You see the movies and it's like, you know, you're morphing and change. Nope. It says in verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. There's that word again. And we shall be changed. So one day the Lord is going to return. There will be a trumpet blast and I cannot in my wildest dreams imagine what that trumpet will sound like. But when that trumpet blows, you're going to know this is the end. And in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, it's not a slow, painful process. It's just, boom, I was in this body. And in the twinkling of an eye, I'm in the other body. Same but different. The living will be changed. And so verses 51 and 52 tell us that those who are living are instantly going to be changed when the Lord returns, when the last trumpet sounds. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 talks also about the return of Jesus. It talks about him bringing the saints with him when he returns. And it talks about the dead in Christ rising first. That's a great passage to read alongside 1 Corinthians 15. This is what we believe. This is what Christianity teaches. And by the way, don't listen to people that say, well, all religions are basically the same. You know, the Muslims are teaching some good ethical things and and over here the Buddhists are teaching some good ethical things. Nobody but Christians believes this. Nobody. And this is wildly, vastly different from anything that you'd ever read in the Quran or anything that you'd ever read in Buddhist or Hindu scriptures. This is radically different. This is our hope. This is what we're looking forward to. This is why we suffer and sacrifice for Jesus. This is why we live the Christian life at all, because we believe that when we die, we're still going to see each other again. We believe that we're going to come back from the dead one day. We believe that every single time we have a funeral, that's still not the end. That's something that we need to get into our minds. This is a critical New Testament teaching. It's not something that you can just take it or leave it or be fascinated by. This is what we're all about because this is what God has done for us. When he raised Jesus from the dead, he guaranteed you and I are going to rise from the dead one day. At the last trumpet, when that trumpet sounds, the mortal, this body that gets sick and old, is going to put on immortality. I wish I knew more about what that was, but I'm happy with that. When the trumpet sounds, this body that's perishable is going to put on an imperishable imperishable body wish I knew more about that, but I'm happy with what God says. And so for all eternity, brothers and sisters and friends, Scripture teaches our spirit is going to live in a body that is immortal, that is imperishable, that is perfectly suited for heaven and existence in the presence of God. Whatever that means, that's our hope. And there is no religion in this world other than New Testament Christianity that believes anything close to that. Transformation. Look again at the passage. As you think about this, in verse 55, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? You know what that is in verse 55? It is a taunt. People are going to taunt death itself. Because death, even though it looked like it had the victory, has lost the battle. It's already lost the battle. When Jesus rose from the dead, the battle was lost. But ultimately, when Jesus returns and the trumpet blows and the living are changed and the dead rise, when all that happens, then shall be brought to pass the saying, Oh, death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? We don't grieve as those who have no hope. We don't cry for the loss of loved ones as those who are never going to see our loved ones again. That's what's different about Christians. And this passage closes with two applications, verses 56 and 57. The applications are these. Number one, we need to believe deep down in our soul that we are going to have victory over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Emphasis on through our Lord Jesus Christ. If he had not done what he did, none of this would be true. Second, our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Whatever you do for Jesus, 
the sacrifices you make, the things that nobody notices, the things that you think are forgotten, a lot of stuff that you have forgotten yourself. All those things are profitable. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Why is it not in vain? Because this mortal, perishable, corruptible body is going to be changed to an immortal, imperishable, incorruptible body. That's our hope. You know, I've been reading these passages at funerals for years, and it's, it's just one of those passages you expect to hear, that in the twinkling of an eye, the, the living are going to be changed. I suspect, just kind of looking into some of your eyes, <laughs> I suspect it's been a while since some of you have really thought about this. This is our hope. The Bible talks about the one hope of Christians. This is the kind of thing it's talking about. And we do well to glory and revel in what God has promised us through Jesus. If we can help you obey the gospel tonight, or if we can pray for you, pray with you, there's no better time to put on Christ than right here, right now. If we can help you in any way, why don't you come all together we stand and while we sing.